G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Faith Foundations. I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so we're into part three of the local church. Um, we finished up last session looking at the elders. Now we're going to look at church discipline. Um, we're going to look at the necessity and, and categories requiring discipline. Uh, there are several places in Scripture that state the necessity for church discipline as well as the categories that require discipline. First of all, when we have difficulties between members of a local church that could require church discipline, we see that in Matthew 18, 15, where you know, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you as witnesses and then bring the charge against him again. So that's the first first situation where we have difficulty between members in the local church. Secondly, uh, church discipline is necessary to avoid divisions within the church. Now, Paul instructs elders to mark out those causing divisions for the purpose of discipline. If the leadership fails to discipline those causing divisions, then what's going to happen is the church is going to face an unnecessary church split. You can have a look at that in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. A third thing, church discipline is necessary for the purity of the church. Uh, and this, this also provides a category here for church discipline, which is immorality. Uh, a person practicing or living in immorality must be disciplined by the local church. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13 is a very good example of that and the way that Paul uh, advised the church to deal with that issue. And then we have fourth, the necessity uh, for church discipline is to bring the uh, offender to repentance. So if discipline is not exercised, repentance may never come. And we can see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Fifth, uh, a necessity for church discipline is to avoid disorderly conduct. Now, the category requiring church discipline, discipline given by this passage here in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15, refers to those who refuse to work. You know, uh, they're saying, you know, there are those within the church who think that uh, the church should support them. They should be disciplined by the church. The church has no responsibility to meet the needs of a member who refuses to work for a living. And then uh, the uh, number six, church discipline is necessary in cases of false doctrine, false teaching. Anyone who has begun to teach falsely and is blaspheming is subject to church discipline. Uh, First Timothy 8 to 20 uh, gives you a good example of that. And then seventh, church discipline is also necessary to avoid crass sins. Sometimes in the exercise of church discipline, it is necessary to reprove someone in the sight of all. Now, Paul uh, had to do this with Peter in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. He had to call him out because he, uh, you know, he, he was eating with the Gentiles. And then when other Jews came along, he, he withdrew from eating with the Gentiles and caused other Jews to withdraw as well. So Paul pulled him aside in front of everyone and called him out. Eighth, church discipline is necessary to avoid the spread of false teachings. So if the church lets a false teacher go undisciplined, the false teachings will naturally spread. If the church disciplines the false teacher, then the false teachings will stop one way or the other. Either the false teacher repents or he leaves the church. Second Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 17 to 18 uh, demonstrate this. Church discipline is also necessary to avoid factious perversions. Uh, we see this in uh, uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 9 to 11, uh, where, where, Titus, where, where he writes here, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs at division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. 
So that's necessarily where we have a factious perversions. The procedure for church discipline we find in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. Again, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Verse 18 says, Truly, I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This passage here is all about church discipline, nothing else. It's not to do with what the church is or not to do with binding Satan. This is purely about church discipline. The procedure given in this passage, uh, Matthew 18, um, requires four specific steps. First of all, there must be a private con confrontation by the offended one with the offender. So the offended person has the responsibility to approach the offender and show him the problem. If the offender responds, that settles the case right there. In fact, the offended person should not go and tell everybody else how he has been offended before talking to the, the person who has done the offense. It, it's a private matter. If the offender then refuses to respond, then comes a second step where the offended must then approach the offender again, but this time with two or three witnesses. According to Galatians 6.1, the two or three witnesses must be men who are spiritually mature. They cannot be new or young believers, and it might be wise that these two men be elders of the local church. If the person responds to the admonition of the two or three witnesses, the matter ends there. But if he does not respond, then the third stage is to bring it before the entire local church. And this point is re-emphasized in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, and 2 Corinthians 2, verse 6, where it says, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough, it, it speaks about here. You also see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 15. So it, it starts off with, with the procedure. It's it's one on one first with the, the offended and the offender. Then the, the offended person takes uh, two witnesses with him to then confront the, offend, the offendee. Or, or the offender, and then if that doesn't work, the entire thing is brought before the entire church and, and brought before the church and made public. Now, if he still refuses, then comes a critical fourth step, which is excommunication, or as is put in, in Matthew account, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, meaning let him now be untouchable. Excommunication means that he is now placed outside the local church. He's expelled from the local church and people in the local church are admonished not to fellowship with him, not to ease the pain of excommunication in, in any way. He's no longer, this person is now no longer under the protection of the prayers of the saints or the prayers of the local church. Also, according to uh, 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 5, he is placed back under Satan's authority for the destruction of the flesh, although the passage goes on to clearly state that his spirit will still be saved. This is the procedure for church discipline. A local church must follow these four steps. If it does not, then the discipline is not biblical discipline. So there are four very plain steps for the church to follow in discipline. Now, what are the forms of discipline? Well, we have several. We have uh, uh, three different forms of discipline. First up, there is admonishment and warning, which we find in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. Uh, this, this, would act, would, this would really come with the second or third step 
in the in the in the actual procedure before. Now the second form is exclusion from fellowship, where the offender is now excluded from the meeting of the church and members of the local church are now asked not to fellowship with him. Uh, we see this in Second Thessalonians chapter three verse six and chapter three verse fourteen. The third form of discipline is excommunication. First Corinthians five five. Uh, again, remember excommunication now puts the offender not just outside the local church, but actually puts him into the hands of Satan for the destruction of his physical life. Whereas it is normally God who puts the believer to death. Normally it's actually Jesus who puts the believer to death. It's on account of Jesus or by Jesus. In the case of an excommunicated believer, Satan will put him to death. Although Satan has no authority over his spiritual life, he will still be saved. In 1 Corinthians 5, 5, Paul says to deliver, this is a, this is a young man sleeping with his, father, with his father's wife. He says to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day. Now, practice of church discipline. There are two examples of the practice of church discipline in scripture. One example is in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5, uh, where discipline is for immorality. Uh, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1, it is actually tolerate, uh, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit and is and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's the first example that we see of church discipline. Second one is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20 where discipline was for the sin of blasphemy. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So there we go. There are the two examples of church discipline. And in both instances here, they have now been handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now we have some attitudes in church discipline, uh, and this should be held by those who are actually exercising church discipline. The Bible speaks of two key attitudes. First of all, it must be it must be discipline must be done in meekness. Galatians 6 1 tells us this. And secondly, it must be done with the spirit of being willing to forgive if the person will finally respond. And, and again, we see uh, similar things here in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, and 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 to 13. Now, what are the effects of church discipline? Well, we're going to have the effects on two people. We're going to have it on the individual and also on the, the local congregation. So what should the effects of church discipline be? Well, um, the effects of discipline on the individual, if it is accepted, will be twofold. First of all, there will be sorrow. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7. And secondly, there will be shame. And that's a shame because of the offense that was committed and that's in second thessalonians chapter 3 verse 14 so that's on the individual we have sorrow and we have uh, a sense of shame because of the sin committed and the effects of discipline in the local congregation is threefold uh, first of all it, the local congregation will now be protected from any further decay uh, and that goes back to that first uh, corinthians 5 verse 5 passage Secondly, the congregation will now feel a godly fear 
which we see in 1 Timothy 5, verse 20. And thirdly, it will have the attitude that restoration is the goal of discipline. And now, punishment is not the goal of discipline. Rather, the goal of, of, of carrying out discipline is restoration of the individual back into fellowship with the fellow believers. And we find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Now, leaving uh, discipline behind, we now go on to the Sabbath and Sunday. Uh, and this is to do with the local church. And we're going to shoot in these two parts, the Sabbath and Sunday. Now, the English word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. And that means to desist, to cease, or to rest. Now, with the end of the sixth day of creation, God finished his creative work. And on the seventh day, he rested. Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 to 3 tells us this. Now, there is no use of the term Shabbat in the book of Genesis. The only term used is the seventh day. Now, with this brief explanation of the Sabbath, the first part we're going to see we're going to see it in four units here. The first one, first part, we're going to see from Adam to Moses. <clears throat> now, between Adam and Moses, the Sabbath was not ob observed. The one major book that was written during the period between Adam and Moses was the book of Job. And Job does not even mention the Sabbath. Even within the historical books of Genesis and the first part of Exodus, before the time of, of Moses, there is no record of any of the people keeping the Sabbath. One does not read of anyone's keeping the Sabbath, not Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph. None of them kept Sabbath. Now, between Adam and Moses, there was no keeping of the Sabbath because the Sabbath was not a command. But now we come from Moses to Jesus. So from Moses on to the time of Jesus the Messiah, the Sabbath was now mandatory. The very first mention of the Sabbath is in conjunction with Moses in Exodus chapter 16, verse 23, and Exodus chapter 16, verses 29 to 30. This is the first mention of anyone's observing the Sabbath. The Sabbath was mentioned as the seventh day of creation. But there was no record of anyone's observing the Sabbath. It was not a creation ordinance. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 10 to 11, keeping the Sabbath became one of the Ten Commandments. Now, Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 14, also points out that the Sabbath began with Moses. It didn't start in Genesis. Second thing to note about the Sabbath between Moses and Jesus is that the Sabbath was obligatory for Jews, but not obligatory for Gentiles. That we need to keep that in mind in relationship to the claims from, from groups like the Seventh-day Adventists. Exodus 31 verses 12 to 17 states that the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel. But Seventh-day Adventists are not part of the people of Israel, and so the Sabbath does not apply to them. Also, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, the Sabbath was a sign of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. God never brought the Seventh-day Adventist church out of the land of Egypt as he brought out Israel. Even the prophets emphasize the same point. They never make Sabbath observance obligatory for all humanity, only upon Israel. Israel is the only one who was obliged to keep the Sabbath. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12 and chapter 20, verse 20, re-emphasize the fact that the Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel. A third thing to note about the Sabbath between Moses and Jesus is that there was a prophecy about a future cessation of Sabbath observance in Hosea chapter 2, verse 11. So he's saying uh, there would be a time when it would come to an end. Now, the third area is in the present age, is today. What about the Sabbath in this present age? 
two things. First of all, Sabbath observance was never ever transferred to Sunday. The Sabbath is still the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. The Sabbath is still from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday. That is the sixth, that is the seventh day of the week. That is the Sabbath day. Secondly, it is no longer mandatory to observe the Sabbath in the present age. The Sabbath day is mentioned nine times in the book of Acts, but it is never mentioned in connection with the worship of believers. In every case where the Sabbath is mentioned in the book of Acts, it speaks of a synagogue observance on the Sabbath day, not observance by believers. Seventh day Adventists, again, they use Paul's actions of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And they should be reminded here that the synagogue worship is not the church service. If they really want to follow Paul's example, they should not go, what they should do is not go to their own churches on Saturday, but go to synagogue on Saturday. Again, the nine times that the Sabbath is mentioned in the book of Acts, it is always in connection with the synagogue observance of the Mosaic law, but never in connection with the worship of believers that now constitute the body of the Messiah. In the epistles, the Sabbath is mentioned in Romans chapter 14, verse 5, Galatians 4, 9 to 10, and Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. In none of these passages is the believer obligated to worship on the Sabbath. For example, Romans 14, 5 states, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, according to Romans 14, verse 5, this verse says, in this day and age, there is no special day of the week that must be set aside. For one man may esteem one day as special, and another man may esteem every day alike. But each man is to be fully persuaded in his own mind. Whichever way a person chooses, if he, he's free to choose, He's free to set a day of the week aside and he's free not to set a day of the week aside. Either way, it's fine with the Lord. It does not matter. Another passage is Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. This states here, But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Now, Paul's talking to uh, Gentile believers of Galatia here, and he admonishes them not to get caught up with the things of the Mosaic law. They should not be concerned about the observance of certain things. And he mentions days. Days, these are Sabbath days. Months, which would be the new moon festivals. Each month they have a new moon festival. And in seasons such as the Passover or Yom Kippur, which is where we are today, and they have years, and these years are the sabbatical years. So Paul said that these things are not intended for the new entity, the church. These are things which were part of the Mosaic law system. One last passage is Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul said to let no man judge a believer concerning the things of the Mosaic law. One of these things is Sabbath days. So if one does not observe the Sabbath, and the Seventh-day Adventist comes to condemn him, according to this verse, he's clearly out of line. The point of these verses is that during the present age, Saturday is still the Sabbath, for it was never transferred to Sunday, but there is no command to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is no longer mandatory for any believers. In the Messianic kingdom, what's going to happen there? Well, in the kingdom... The Sabbath will once again be a day of mandatory rest. We see this in Isaiah 66, verse 23, and also in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1. 
Isaiah 66 verse 23 says this, from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Now, this is in the kingdom when, when the nations are coming to worship the Lord. And he's talking about the Sabbath being reinstituted once again as a mandatory day of rest. Now, Sunday. Second part of this section we're in now deals with the issue of Sunday, and we look at three areas here. Its name, its observance, and the fact that there is no commandment regarding Sunday observance. Now, where do we get the name from? Well, the English term Sunday actually originates from a pagan name for this first day of the week. The term Sunday is never, the term Sunday is never used in the Bible for this particular day. Biblically, it is never called Sunday, nor is it ever called the Sabbath, and it is never called the Lord's Day. Although this is a very common term that believers use for this day, the Bible never calls Sunday the Lord's Day. The one name given in the Bible is always the first day of the week. And this is in keeping with the Hebrew names for the, for the days of the week. In Hebrew, the first day of the week is called just that, the first day of the week. And it's the only New Testament name used for this day. Now, regard the observance, this is the second area in the issue of Sunday, is that the believer's observance on Sunday as a time of gathering was based on certain happenings on that day. In the New Testament, there are six events that happened on the first day of the week. First, well, first of all, of course, was the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. That happened on the first day of the week. Messiah was resurrected on the first day of the week, and that point is made by all four Gospels. Matthew 28, verse 1, Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1, John 20, verse 1. All say that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Second event that happened on the first day of the week was that Jesus appeared to 10 of his disciples on this day. You find it in John 20, verse 19. A third event happened exactly one week later, also on the first day of the week, and that was the appearance to the 11 disciples where Thomas was now included, whereas he was, in, he was excluded in, in the previous appearance to the 10. We find this in John chapter 20, verse 26. The fourth event that happened on the first day of the week was the birthday of the church. Now, this can be surmised by comparing what is stated in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, with Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 to 16. By comparing these two passages, it seems evident that the Holy Spirit's arrival on the church was on the first day of the week. The fifth event that happened on this day is that the church gathered in Troas on the first day of the week. It was, it was already a very early practice for believers to gather on the first day of the week. Uh, we find it in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. The sixth event that happened on the first day of the week was that this was a time that the offering was to be set aside. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. That shows us that. Now, throughout history, therefore, the reason that believers have chosen Sunday as the day of weekly observance is because of these six events which all happened on this day. A very common misconception is the teaching that Sunday observance began with the Roman Catholic Church. That's not true. First day observance began with the Jewish believers in the first century. The reason was very simple. It was customary for Jewish believers to continue worshipping with unbelieving Jews in their regular worship at the synagogue on the Sabbath day, Saturday. For example, we see the apostles, they went to the temple to worship on the Sabbath day, and the early Jewish believers went with other Jews to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Many times in, in the book of Acts, Paul, Barnabas, and Silas, among others, would attend the synagogue service on the Sabbath day. Now, since the early believers were all Jews, they continued meeting with other Jews in the synagogue or in the temple on the Sabbath day. But being believers, they also wished to meet among themselves exclusively as believers. So they chose the next day, which was the first day of the week. 
They did not necessarily do it on what is called Sunday morning because I had to go to work on Sunday morning. S Sunday, the first day of the week, was a work day for the Jew. The Jewish Sabbath is from Sunday and Friday until Sunday and Saturday. The first day of the week begins at Sunday and Saturday, not, not at midnight on Saturday. On Saturday evening at sundown was already the first day of the week. And the Jewish believers would then gather together. It was not the Roman Catholic Church that began Sunday observance, but it was the Jewish believers. And they did not meet Sunday morning. They met on what is Saturday night after Shabbat had finished. Yeah, there's a story in the Jewish Talmud of a rabbinical discussion concerning the issue of why Jews do not fast on the first day of the week. The quotation goes something like this. We do not fast on the Sabbath day because it is a Sabbath day, nor do we fast on the day before the Sabbath in order to honor the Sabbath. Why do we not fast on the day after the Sabbath? Because of the Nazarenes. Now, this is in the Talmud. The term Nazarene was the early rabbinic term for Jews who believed in the Messiahship of Jesus. And one can find the Jewish leaders calling the Jewish believers Nazarenes as early as the book of Acts. The reason the rabbis tried to tell Jewish people not to fast on Sunday, the first day of the week, was to avoid showing any honor to the day that the Jewish believers considered sacred which was the first day of the week. So from both biblical sources and Jewish sources of the period, the start of worship on the first day of the week did not begin with the Roman Catholic Church, but with the Jewish believers. Now, third thing regarding Sunday. There is no command regarding Sunday observance. It is not a command. There is no command at all to observe Sunday. The command given in Scripture is that believers are to gather together. We find this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25 to 26. The day that the individual local congregation may choose is totally up to the local church. If the local church has chosen to gather together on Sunday, perfectly all right. The local church Sunday decides to meet only on Tuesdays, that would also be biblically all right, as there is no mandatory Sunday observance. It is mandatory to gather, but each local church has the freedom to choose on which day of the week it will do so. In Israel, churches meet on Saturday. Why? Not because they feel they have to observe the Sabbath, but because Sunday is just another work day for the Israeli believer, and he has to make a living. The evangelical fundamental churches in Israel that are indigenous meet on the seventh day on Saturday. Now, in Muslim countries, the churches meet on Fridays, because that's the day off for one who lives in a Muslim country. All of these things are perfectly legitimate within the context of what the Bible allows now the meeting of the church this is the seventh section of the study of the local church it answers the question now how do we define the meeting of the church what is it well many of the regulations on how the church meeting is to be conducted apply to the meeting of the church from various passages in the new testament it is evident that there were five elements in the meeting of a church the first element was the exercise of spiritual gifts. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. The second element was the practice of the Lord's Supper. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. The third element was the laying aside of the offering, which we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. And fourthly, there were prayers to be conducted. We see that in 1 Timothy to uh, cha chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 yeah and fifth we then had the giving of testimonies and missionary reports which we found which we find in acts chapter 14 verse 27 now not one of these five elements 
can be used to define the meeting of the church. There is one common element, and that is based upon the root meaning of the Greek word for church, which is kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, and that means to call out. The best way to define the meeting of the church is that it is a called out meeting by the elders who have the authority to do so. Their presence is necessary for the meeting to be conducted as the elders. Any meeting officially called by the elders for any purpose is the meeting of the church. Whenever the elders call a meeting, that is the meeting of the church. The purpose might be worship. It might be a business meeting or, or some other reason. But at any time that the elders of the church call a meeting, their presence is required for the meeting to be conducted, and that is the meeting of the church. It is then that the various rules of proper actions and proper decorum concerning the local church now apply. They do not apply by just entering a building where the church meets. They apply only if the meeting itself was called out by the elders. And that is where we're going to leave it in this session, because the next session will look completely at the role of women within the church. Thank you for coming along. Enjoy and study hard and grow strong.